Will you? Maybe my circle light, so if you can. This is meta governance. Sorry. Maybe. Let's arrange the arrangements. Yeah, there's no one presenting something, and for the names, it's OK. So, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to start. If you could take your seats, please, that would be great. Thanks so much. So, welcome to the second session of the day. You can see that we already took charge here because we changed the environment and uh, the ecosystem, at least the, the code part of the ecosystem, the hardware part, um, to make it a little more like a conversation here. Nevertheless, we will start with this panel as well with some um, input by the panelists, which I will introduce in a second. Um, because um, what we will do right now on this panel is a little different um, to the discussion uh, on this uh, subject and other circumstances. I'm personally a newcomer, I'm Wolfgang Schulz, by the way, uh, working with the Humboldt Institute in Berlin and the Hans Bredow Institute in Hamburg on internet issues and other issues. And um, my, I, I'm a newcomer to the scene, and my impression is that when you start, talking about concepts here in this sphere, then the veterans of internet governance come and say, oh my God, it's old, we had that 10 years ago, and IGF 1900, so and so, we had it already. And that's one reason why we, as the uh, centers, the network of centers on internet and society research, uh, had um, the idea to come up with another approach uh, and uh, to draft case studies, case studies that are very heterogeneous, um, dealing with different issues from different countries, uh, from um, with different problems to solve, uh, and so on. Very heterogeneous, you will see that. But nevertheless, the idea behind that is that there can be some input, some takeaways that can inform the debate on the evolution of the internet governance ecosystem. And that exactly is the purpose of uh, this session, that we first of all uh, want to give an insight into these cases, what is the case there, what are people um, uh, talking about in this uh, specific environment, what is the setting, what is the dynamic uh, in that, and second step to see what are the takeaways, what are the learning opportunities for the debate on the internet ecosystem. And uh, I think we can roughly structure the debate uh, this way. And I would like to introduce my uh, panelists here, that is Anne Salim, sitting next to me from IHUB in Kenya. A um, very interesting case uh, she has uh, um, done research into, but nevertheless, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you are somehow part of the ecosystem and do a lot of uh, stakeholder management yourself. So, very interesting to hear uh, what you will um, uh, present to us. Uh, right on my right side, um, that's Daniel Ben Nuliel from Haifa University, um, colleagues in the networks of uh, centers and uh, uh, working with them for a couple of years already, has drafted a case study in this first basket of case studies and will present some insights. Uh, thanks for being with us. Um, Jeanette Hoffmann uh, on the left-hand side, a dear colleague from the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, uh, but uh, also working for a lot of years in the internet governance uh, research and the internet governance scene. I personally call her Jeanette Mundial because uh, she has a major role in, uh, in this event in Brazil uh, from the academic side and uh, she has drafted, an, uh, an, uh, sorry for just talking about those secrets, um, she has drafted together with other people like Kirsten Gollers who is with us today as well, um, um, study on the German Enquete Commission, and we'll talk about that later on. Another person deeply involved in the Net Mundial uh, process is uh, Marilia Maciel, 
uh, from FGV um, Law Faculty in Rio um, and um, a member of the Network of Centers and uh, working with us on many projects and ideas. Um, and uh, the same is true for Laila Kaiser from the IT Law Institute of the Bilge University in Istanbul. We had uh, a conference there on similar issues a couple of months ago, and so this is really kind of follow-up. And she also has uh, worked on a case study. And uh, last but not least, uh, it's uh, Ryan uh, Buddish from um, the Bergman Center at Harvard University, and he has not only um, worked on a case study, not from the US, but from Switzerland um, in this project, but um, he was also deeply involved in coordinating the whole thing and has therefore a special perspective on it uh, because he was uh, the one who um, had the first idea for the um, the uh, grid of points um, which all case studies should observe when um, uh, dive into the subject matter of their specific cases. So that's the setup for today. I would now like to invite um, each of you to uh, present for five minutes, please not more. I have told most of you that when I take my iPhone and look at it, it's just because there's the time on it and that's an indicator that the five minutes are gone. It's not because I want to check emails because it's so boring. It's uh, the other way around that I want to get the discussion stimulated. And um, I would like um, you to present, if you like, your first uh, case. Yes. So thank you, Wolfgang. Thank you, everybody, and good morning once again. Uh, so I will present a um, case study that deals with cybersecurity with the case of the Israeli Cyber uh, Security Bureau that was established in 2011 and has an interesting story uh, worldwide, I mean, for the, in, the, in the context of cybersecurity, but to some degree also more broadly with a, the with a scope of internet governance in mind. Um, the policy brief I have uh, produced uh, reviews cross-sectionally examines or, compar or compares five countries, that is the United States, United Kingdom, uh, Germany, of course, Japan, and the Netherlands, uh, and the idea is to find a couple of set of basic insights that could serve us when we think, uh, again, about cybersecurity at the one level, and then more broadly, as I will try here to explain also on, uh, about internet governance. The uh, question remains, why Israel? So maybe two reasons explain why Israel uh, as a case in point. Uh, reason number one has to do with Israel's industry. I was admit admittedly surprised to know that uh, after the United States, Israel has the biggest industry of cyber security. Uh, it's a bigger industry than the entire world together, more than the United Kingdom and the European Union and China and Brazil and, and, and India and the, the entire world. So it's a huge industry. I was not so aware of the size and the, mag the magnitude. And then it's one reason why Israel is an interesting case study. Uh, the second reason is that it's ranked as a, you got a top rank for a cyber defense by the Security and Defense Agenda, the SDA. It's a non-governmental sitting in Brussels. It's an important indication that pretty much something is being done correctly vis-a-vis -vis cybersecurity there. And let's see what is going on there and if there's anything that we can learn from uh, the Israeli example. So two official milestones, 2010, Israel uh, has established a cybersecurity mandate to make Israel, by 2015, a top five leading uh, cybersecurity country with a you know, technological establishment that would support that, of course. In 2011, there is a government uh, decision that implements the agenda uh, and so forth. Um, and at the core of the whole uh, set of policy and the establishment of a cyber command is the, uh, indeed the establishment of an organization uh, known to be the Israeli National Cyber, cyber Bureau, the INCB, uh, sitting in, a prime, in the Prime Minister's office and uh, reporting directly to the Prime Minister. Three uh, mandates, one is relevant more than the other two to internet governance, as I will explain. The first, of course, is to protect, like, all other countries with cybersecurity policies do to protect national infrastructure and to put much emphasis that is also a reflection of what is happening at the industry on defensive as opposed to offensive measurements as opposed to just think about the offensive measurements. It's mostly actually a defensive set of measurements and so defend uh, national infra infrastructure would be one thing. The second is to advance each industry, local industry, which in a certain point in my talk, I'll explain, is also a minus when we think of internet governance. But then again, advance the, the present industry and ride the wave, so to speak, of what is already there. And thirdly, which is more relevant to our uh, case in point here, is 
to think uh, and to, uh, to educate and encourage cooperation uh, of a multi-stakeholder type of uh, model. And that is strictly said in the agenda, and I will refer to that as, as we go by. I quickly want to uh, suggest five lessons that, be, uh, that I believe are not relevant also only, of course, to Israel and to other uh, cybersecurity countries, namely the ones I mentioned, which is the, the five countries, as you can recall. But then, as much as humanly possible, also speak a little bit about internet governance and more, in more broad terms. So here are the five, uh, uh, my five two cents, so to speak, I, I wish to also add that also based on uh, interviews uh, I have conducted with senior officials at the Cyber Command, and so it's more than just what they write and, and publish and, uh, and declare, but actually what they do and the failures and difficulties they admit to have when, once you get to talk to them as I did in person. And these are the four lessons which have certain relevancy uh, to internet governance. First and foremost, cybersecurity uh, as many fields of technology are still evolving in such a way that risk and threats in the context of cybersecurity in many, in many cases and in, to a large degree are still untried, are still unattended. We, we have not taken the road no taken. We do not know what will happen, what uh, road will technology take. And that have, uh, has, of course, three simple implications, uh, as they have in Israel with the Israeli uh, policy. Implication number one is the adoption of, of regulatory mo modularity. So Israel has adopted um, an approach vis-a-vis cybersecurity themes where, whereby it has developed certain themes from a legal perspective, that is, and has neglected to at least develop much less other themes that it finds to be more challenging, more complicated. Uh, there's a lot of politics playing in, no doubt, but just to make a point, Cybercrime is quite developed. Israel has done a substantive efforts, such as the one European countries, its counterparts in Japan and, and the others have done with cybercrime, with the adoption of the Council of Europe's Convention on Cybercrime, the Budapest Convention. And on the other hand, it has done much less. Again, politically speaking, it's well understood in the context of Israel and the Israeli Arab conflict. It has done much less in developing IHL-related policies, international humanitarian law-related policies, the definition of, an, uh, of a cyber attack, uh, cyber war even, uh, and uh, many uh, definitions that are still uh, pending, such as a cyber combatant, self-defense, collective defense, and so forth. And so there's a certain degree of uh, regulatory modularity that you see there and is part and parcel of what is happening within uh, the first set of uh, recommendations, so to speak. A second thing, uh, giving this, uh, if you may, uh, a technological uh, determinism that is being uh, admitted by Israel uh, in the context of cybersecurity, is the, again, a, a moderate approach vis-a-vis -vis SSOs, standard setting organizations. Uh, way before governments have begun initiating cybersecurity policies, standard setting organizations were there big time. There are four types of such uh, standard setting initiatives, that uh, of the ISO as of 2005 and henceforth, and that of uh, the Information Security Forum, the ISF, and the, the Software Assurance Maturity Model, which is also very important, and that of the Cloud Security Alliance, at the C C CSA, just to name the names, uh, that deal obviously with the cloud, com cloud computing and cybersecurity within the context of clouds. And so, Israel, again, has understood, uh, I believe correctly so, that there needs to be much tolerance to SSOs and to the most you know, uh, broad extent to have governmental SSOs cooperation and nothing that looks like a governmental takeover over cybersecurity at the regulatory level, that is. Thirdly, administrative flexibility and judicial restraint, the equivalence of the non-delegation doctrine in the United States a constitutional legal system is also perceived to be a part of Israeli constitutional slash administrative law, namely not to allow a, a institutions and entities to regulate the field of cybersecurity unless it is really binded by, by law and, 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 the, and the constitution. But other than that, in very extreme cases, that is indeed the case. Avoid intervention in uh, places or uh, areas that are technologically driven more than, if you may, legally relevant, or at least legally mature, if I was 
clear on that. The second point, I'll be clear about the four remaining ones, is the reactive nature, the reactive nature of the cybersecurity command. They understood while establishing this cybersecurity command bureau that they you don't start from, from scratch while establishing one type, one model of internet governance, namely cybersecurity. It's already there. You need to go and confront the uh, equivalent of your FBI, the equivalent of your CIA and NSA and the others before you start initiating anything. And if you look backwards, to a certain degree, uh, with regret, if I can almost quote people I've spoken to, you get to understand that the thing you actually end up doing is, co is coordinate others, not really inventing anything. You coordinate more than actually uh, steer, more than actually design internet governance in the scope of cybersecurity. And so the result is much more modest than anticipated earlier on. So that was lesson number two. Lesson number three uh, has to do with national differences. Israel, as opposed to other, of other countries I have reviewed, as I mentioned, again, just the United States, United Kingdom, the Netherlands, Germany, Japan, um, uh, and the, the, okay, so these are the countries, is different uh, in one context that is relevant and parallel to other contexts within internet governance. And what is the difference? Whereas in the rest of the case studies I have reviewed, it is clear that cybersecurity started, initiated with cybercrime policies, combating cybercrime on its many variations. In Israel, it does not have been the case. In Israel, it started with the national security motivations to combat national security threats that are obviously understandable in the context of, again, the Israeli-Arab conflict at large. And maybe the Israeli-Muslim conflict, regrettably, at large. And so it's a different mechanism that actually led to the establishment of this mechanism. Obviously, cybercrime is part of the story, but it's not the initiative part of the story. It doesn't reflect the real DNA, the, the core essence of the, the policy. Uh, just for the sake of the argument um, that you just mentioned the last points, only what the points are, and you have later the opportunity. Okay, so the two other points are promoting R&D. Israel took to heart the issue of promoting R&D, and mostly with university-based uh, research centers, I'll say a few things about that later, much less, much less and surprisingly so, to me at least, international cooperation on uh, the academic level, much less uh, multi-stakeholder apparatuses uh, that you could think of when you think of internet governance in the absolute term, uh, of how uh, the multi-stakeholder uh, uh, theory would prefer uh, cooperation. And lastly, the fourth principle is the lack of constitutionality that is also present in the story and the problem of who should guard or who can, not should, but also can guard the guards, namely governments, regulating, organizing, cooperating, coordinating internet governance. Who should cooperate against uh, schemes by governments at some point in time uh, when they try to circumvent the rule of law? And it happens also in the context of internet governance. You see in uh, cybersecurity, you see clearly that not only Israel, but none of the five plus six, six Israeli examples I have reviewed, none of the examples, European, American, and the Japanese examples, none of them have regulated IHL or international uh, humanitarian law related policies and state responsibility equivalent policies that regulate uh, self-defense on the one hand, but then combatancy, unlawful combatancy, and of course, uh, the remaining uh, usages of military force uh, and the, even the definition of an all-out war. So all of that was left aside. Who should take care of fixate, fixating uh, or fixing that type of uh, unconstitutionality, if you may, remains a question and a challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Interesting example. We certainly will come back to many points uh, in the discussion. Maybe, Leila, if you would like to present your a case briefly. Um, the mic is there. It's also important to discuss uh, of the, the Daniel's uh, remarks. Uh, we can also say something about it after our presentation. Um, hello, I'm Leila Kesar. Uh, thank you very much uh, for Nexa um, organizing this conference and inviting us to uh, Nice City Turin, the first time here. And I, uh, on behalf of Network of Centers, uh, as IT Law Institute, we uh, wrote a, a report on um, the experience of Turkish Internet Improvement Board. Um, the Internet Improvement Board works under the Ministry of Communication and Transportation of Turkey, which is the responsible body 
uh, for regulating and coordinating internet in terms of legislation and policies. Uh, that board consists of uh, seven members, uh, and each of them represent, uh, represents different stakeholders. For example, I'm a member of also of that board, and I'm represent, uh, I represent uh, academia, and other members come from civil sector, uh, a private sector, civil society, technical groups, and government. Um, there are also different uh, working groups under uh, the Internet Improvement Board. One of them is legislation uh, working group. Uh, it is important just because we conducted uh, the work, which I will explain shortly, under the, uh, within the uh, legislation working group. Uh, there is a law uh, regarding the internet in Turkey, we call shortly internet law, dated uh, 2007. And in 2007, government enacted uh, that law um, without uh, accepting any contribution from the uh, civil sector or uh, private sector, civil society, academia, and also other technical groups. Uh, after uh, enacting uh, between uh, 2007 and 2010, the internet law caused uh, some of legal problems. Um, for example, freedom of expression problems and also uh, the data protection problems of the citizens and also the uh, criminal liabilities of the intermediaries uh, arose kind of problems. Uh, the restriction access to illegal content uh, was also another important problem just because the law states uh, DNS or IP level uh, restriction uh, and blockage method, uh, that was also another important problem. And in order to solve that kind of legal or technical problems of the internet law in Turkey, the Internet Improvement Board decided in 2010 uh, to combine uh, all stakeholders together uh, in order to prepare a draft law um, and uh, wanted to eliminate uh, the legal problems of the law. And um, the aim and mission of the, um, of the uh, group um, within the legislation working group of the uh, Internet Improvement Board to prepare a draft law uh, and also follow up legislation uh, period of that law. Um, the work which Internet Improvement Board and legislation group conducted uh, took almost one year and in 2011 the work finished, completed. And the draft law which reflects uh, all opinions and approach of the uh, of all stakeholders uh, in Turkey. Uh, the draft law uh, prepared, has been prepared, and also um, the Internet Improvement Board submitted it to the ministry, and the ministry uh, sent uh, that law to the parliament. Uh, what we learned from that period, uh, what kind of lessons uh, which we learned um, as stakeholders, um, first of all, we highlighted the importance of regulatory impact assessment. There is a legal requirement in Turkey, uh, there is a, a communique which states all governmental institutions has to prepare, uh, has, to uh, has to make a um, regulatory impact assessment before submitting uh, a law to the parliament. Uh, despite this uh, legal requirement, the governmental institutions um, are reluctant to do regulatory impact assessment. But without this, uh, we solve the uh, legal uh, problems, we solve, um, we solve and we face the legal problems or other, um, uh, other not good experience uh, regarding at least the internet law. Therefore, we learned uh, the regulatory impact assessment is one of the important part of the legislation. And also, um, based on the work which Internet Improvement Board conducted, we saw there is a need of platform, an objective platform um, for all stakeholders uh, represent, uh, representing the stakeholders and also uh, allow them to explain uh, their ideas and opinions uh, 
regarding the related matter. And also uh, the transparency of the works, uh, transparent work and collaborative work are also uh, important. We saw also uh, the importance of the two principles uh, during our work. Uh, multi-communication channels, to create multi-communication channels for stakeholders are also important. Uh, it uh, it makes easier uh, the, inf uh, the flow of information uh, between stakeholders, therefore it's also an important part. Accountability of the work uh, should have uh, guaranteed during uh, kind of uh, works. And follow-up mechanisms, for example, we submitted that draft law to the parliament and after that we should have to follow its consequences. Um, and also, lastly, I would like to uh, highlight the importance of standards, uh, which Malaika also uh, mentioned. Just because standards create a unique language for the regulators and also for the uh, private sector or civil uh, society or, or also citizens too. Um, it's also important to refer within legislation if there is, in practice, kind of standards in terms of internet governance also. Uh, it makes the things easier for all uh, of stakeholders to refer the standards. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. A, a brief question um, directly. Um, we talked about different models of distributed <laughs> governance and when you look at this model and have a completely distributed thing here and right. some state standard here, where would you locate your uh, distributed model here? We call that exactly as distributed uh, model just because uh, the group really consisted of, um, consist of all related uh, parties. For example, government was a party of that group and also ICT sector, national and international ICT companies in Turkey was a part of, were a part of that. And also uh, technical groups um, also, um, the NGOs in Turkey uh, works on ICT-related matters. And also even citizens, we invited the citizens, blog owners, st uh, students, student clubs, and also the normal citizens um, in Turkey. Mm -hmm. They could also come and uh, they, ha they had the chance to join that work and say something using multi uh, communication channels using the internet websites and also email or other social media communications. Mm. Thanks, thanks much. Uh, Ryan, what have you learned when you looked into the Swiss situation? We have to be careful here, there are Swiss people around, but nevertheless. Uh... Well, thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, the, uh, what we've been looking at is uh, a series of uh, nine round table meetings that took place in Switzerland between 2008 and 2013. And they're interesting because they represent a, a specific approach to, uh, to a identifying and trying to solve a, uh, a particular problem. And that problem was uh, the deployment of fiber to the home, fiber optic cable, uh, that, that goes directly to residences or businesses uh, throughout uh, Switzerland. And uh, the, there, there's, there's an interesting backstory that I won't get into, but uh, the key sort of instigator is that the uh, utility companies in Switzerland who hadn't been involved in telecommunications decided that, uh, that they would like to deploy fiber optic cable, uh, which then put pressure on uh, the incumbent uh, former state-owned monopoly uh, telecommunication provider to announce that they were going to roll out fiber to the home. And so pretty soon you had uh, uh, several uh, companies saying that they were going to start uh, investing uh, a significant amount of money, tearing up roads, building new infrastructure. And so there was this uh, question uh, that emerged about how do we, uh, we being Switzerland, how, how does Switzerland uh, encourage the deployment of fiber to the home but do so in a way that is uh, coordinated, that reduces costs, that reduces disruption. Uh, and so that, that was the problem uh, that was faced. And 
the, uh, the approach uh, was to create this uh, set of roundtables that would bring together key stakeholders to, uh, to, to coordinate their actions uh, and try to uh, uh, develop a uh, cohesive, uh, coordinated approach. And these roundtables were, uh, uh, were convened by ComCom, who's the uh, Swiss telecommunications regulator. And so one of the first uh, interesting things that, uh, observations that we can make uh, from this case study is that ComCom actually had no uh, formal legal authority uh, to force uh, the stakeholders to come to the table and didn't have the formal authority to uh, enforce the decisions that the roundtables would make. The ComCom's legal authority was, uh, was tied to uh, copper cables and sort of the older infrastructure and they didn't have the legal authority uh, to regulate uh, fiber optic cable. But despite that, uh, they were still uh, able to use the fact that, uh, that, that all of the parties, all the stakeholders were interested in finding a more efficient, economical, less disruptive solution uh, and uh, there was also a background threat of regulation uh, that existed that was able to bring the parties to the table. Uh, the second uh, uh, interesting uh, observation is that often uh, when we uh, uh, talk about multi-stakeholder uh, groups, you know, we, we have this vision of, you know, something where every stakeholder is invited to the table on equal footing. Uh, and that was not the approach that ComCom took. Uh, they uh, identified the key stakeholders, which uh, according to uh, our interviews, uh, were, the, uh, were the organizations that were already actively building out uh, fiber optic cable in Switzerland uh, and uh, invited them. Uh, and the, the rationale was that uh, they seemed to want to have a group that was small enough to be able to make decisions, but large enough so that the decisions that they made uh, would be able to hold and would be uh, adopted uh, more broadly. And uh, the next uh, observation was the role of uh, facilitation uh, within the roundtables that this was not something where, uh, where a group of people, interested stakeholders, just came together and magically out of the conversation, a cohesive agreement emerged. Uh, instead, uh, it appears that the, uh, that the convener, ComCom, was very active in initiating bilateral conversations with both the stakeholders who were invited to be a part of the round tables, but also with those stakeholders who may have been uh, 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 interested in the outcome but were not invited to be a part of it. And in fact, by doing that sort of uh, facilitation role uh, with those outside stakeholders, they were able to address uh, some of the concern that, uh, that those outside stakeholders had about not being at the table by ultimately feeling that their views were represented uh, in the discussion. Thanks very much. Extremely interesting as well. Um, just one, one brief question immediately after that. Uh, did you find, uh, when you studied this uh, case, any indications that the cultural context, the special political culture in Switzerland, for example, matters when you set up these kind of uh, instruments? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think that uh, that, that, that's actually something that, that I think, you know, is uh, interesting in all of the case studies and it's often uh, uh, difficult to, to draw a fine line between uh, where the institutions that we're all discussing begin and where sort of the uh, existing political, social, uh, economic and cultural institutions or, uh, or just norms uh, uh, exist. And so 
Um, so I, I think in, in every case study, uh, or at least in many, there seems to be a significant interplay uh, between the, um, the, the, the cultural and political uh, situation, you know, so, sort of like how Daniel was describing the cybersecurity situation that was unique in, in, uh, in Israel, uh, you know, so too uh, in Switzerland, the, the unique relationships that existed between the stakeholders uh, and the, uh, you know, the, the historical development of telecommunications in Switzerland that led to the particular configuration of parties and interests. Yeah, the, I think the first three case studies demonstrate that very nicely that the, the relationship or maybe tension between the regulation in place and what uh, is designed there uh, in this distributed manner, that that is extremely interesting characteristic of, of the case studies. Um, another thing, of course, you all mentioned the, the stakeholder selection and stakeholder management as an important thing. Maybe um, you presenting your cases can have that in mind already and if you like, uh, uh, touch on those issues as well. So Maria, if you would be prepared to give your input, please. Thank you very much. I'll just put my alarm here so I can control the time together with you. <laughs> yeah, self-regulation. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, uh, Nexa, very much for organizing this event. I'm going to present a case study about Net Mundial. This case study was developed by myself, Nicolo Zingales, who is a very brilliant researcher here from Italy, who is now associated with the Tilburg, Tilburg University and spending six months with us in CTS in Brazil. And together with Daniel Fink, who was uh, part of the Net Mundial Secretariat and is now with ICANN. Net Mundial, or the Global Multi-Stakeholder Meeting on the Future of Internet Governance, it is the longer name for it, was convened by the Brazilian government together with CGIBR, who is the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, and a multi-stakeholder platform uh, that uh, unites different actors internationally to discuss internet governance called OneNet. The event was also supported by ICANN, and I think it is important to stress that it, has two, it had two important antecedents. One of them was the Snowden revelations. You may remember that after the revelations, the Brazilian president came really strongly against mass surveillance on the 68th General Assembly. And it's interesting that the response that Brazil gave to the Snowden revelations was to pl provide a platform for dialogue that in which actor schools could discuss this problem together and not um, to give an individual response to it, but to pro promote dialogue. And the second antecedent of Net Mundial is the statement of Montevideo, which is a landmark document that was produced by a platform of actors called ISTAR. The ISTAR are the main technical organizations that work with administering technical aspects of the internet, such as ICANN, the Internet Engineering Task Force, ISOC, the uh, regional internet registries, and so on. Um, so, Net Mundial had two topics on the agenda. The first of them was the need that the community felt to identify a set of universally accepted principles that would apply to internet governance. There are several charts of principles that have been produced, but they are either only regional or only supported by a few stakeholders and not by all stakeholders. So one goal was to identify a set of principles that would guide further policy development and regulation that all actors could agree upon. The second topic on the agenda was the need to propose a way forward for the institutional evolution of the internet governance ecosystem, uh, as we call, and this is a topic that has been on the agenda for a long time as well. But why Net Mundial is important and why we decided to use it as a case study? Of course, the outcome document that came out of Net Mundial, it has important points, such as it reinforces the application of human rights on the internet, it sees the internet as a public resource that should be administered um, on behalf of the public good, it's, it states that uh, multi-stakeholder participation is as important as democracy on internet governance, so multi-stakeholder participation should not be taken for uh, democracy, these are two different 
different things. Uh, and it states that distributed models for internet governance are the best ones. We should not have a centralized model for internet governance, but a distributed one. But apart from the positive aspects of the outcome document, I think that the most interesting thing about Net Mundial that makes it a relevant case study is the process that the actors followed to achieve this outcome document. Um, it's very interesting because the only forum that we have internationally that brings together this diverse group of multi-stakeholder actors is the IGF, the Internet Governance Forum that works under the United Nations. And for many years we tried to make the IGF more outcome-oriented, to make the IGF produce something meaningful that the actors could take home or could take to other organizations. And it was the general understanding that a multi-stakeholder setting which such a diverse group of actors and interests would not be able to produce an outcome document. So I think that Net Mundial shows, first of all, that it is possible to produce an outcome document even though we are so different stakeholders if a good process is followed. And Net Mundial, um, and, and the process of Net Mundial is seen as a key legacy of the event. And it's interesting that the public consultation that led to the production of this outcome document could be divided in three main phases. Um, the first of them was the collection of contributions. So people were free to send contributions about the two topics on the agenda, written contributions. These contributions were summarized by the executive committee that was uh, one of the committees organizing at Mundial, which was also a multi-stakeholder committee. And a first draft of the outcome document was put online for public consultation. This outcome document could be commented uh, paragraph by paragraph. We received more than 1,000 contributions in different paragraphs of the outcome document. These contributions were summarized. And in the day of Net Mundial, it was a two-day meeting in Sao Paulo, both contributions from the floor and contributions that were made online were summarized and then the final outcome document was drafted for approval. So you see that there were layers of layers of public consultation that combine online tools and also face-to-face -face meeting and I think that we made a good use of technology for that. Um, my time is up, <laughs> I see, so um, I will go back and comment some of the aspects that are interesting about the drafting of this document and the multi-stakeholder uh, groups that organized the event on the next opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Nevertheless, uh, a quick uh, question. Um, I borrow a thought from Jeanette here, uh, if I may. Um, uh, her impression was, if I'm not mistaken, that there is a kind of merger of different uh, governance styles at this conference. This more uh, multi-stakeholder governance style and the um, international states uh, governance style. Um, do you agree? Would you say that was uh, the case there? Yes, this was very interesting and it relates to the two uh, committees that were organized. One of them was the executive committee that was responsible to process the registrations and in the second moment we were also tasked to draft the document. And the second group was the high-level committee that was also multi-stakeholder but governments were part of it and it was responsible to set the tone of the event. And it was interesting that after all these consultations took place and the executive committee produced the final outcome draft of, of the document that was sent to the plenary, the high-level committee met. And this was a very tense moment of the event just before the final plenary. And because the governments, first of all, um, they wanted to chime into the process and the executive committee was the one that drafted it and the high-level committee had little contact with the text. And this was a problem because they were not aware of the sensitivities and the balance that we had to strike on drafting those documents and trying to balance the different interests of stakeholders. But the second aspect that is interesting is that some of the, the governments that were part of the high-level committee said, I cannot approve this document that has changed without taking it back to my capital. So one thing that we understand as well is that when you are developing a multi-stakeholder process, you need to take into account the different needs and the different uh, ways of, of stakeholders to operate. And governments have have different constraints, they operate under strict mandates that they receive from the capital, and maybe for a next event, one thing that we need to take into account is to have, is to have this delay that would allow mm. these different actors to combine multi-stakeholder mm. and intergovernmental, we need to, to, be, to take into account the different procedures that we mm. follow as well uh, when we want to approve documents such as this one. Mm. Fascinating, thanks much. 
Jeanette, please. Yeah, thank you, Wolfgang. I'm going to report about the German Enquete Commission for Internet and Digital Society. Both Wolfgang and I have been a member of this commission. Wolfgang uh, nominated by the German Social Democratic Party, me by don't, the German... Don't tell everybody. <laughs> me by the Green, uh, the Green Party. So what is an Enquete Commission? This is more or less um, a unique... Uh, institution in the German political system. One could call it a parliamentary inquiry commission, but it is different from parliamentary inquiry commissions because it includes external experts. The very idea is to bring together uh, democratically legitimized decision makers, meaning members of the parliament and external experts. And the task is to work on complex political issues that sort of exceed the competence of the parliament and its administration. So this was um, the first time that the German parliament really systematically tried to deal with uh, the challenges that the internet has brought about. And it started with a sort of um, critical conflict about blocking internet content. Um, there was some legislation and due to massive protest among civil society in Germany, this law was enacted but never implemented. And all parties involved sort of learned from this conflict that more expertise is needed and the sort of it needs to be broadened and more people need to be brought into um, this area of regulation. So that's why this Enquete Commission was started in 2010 and it worked for roughly three years. This is a normal period of time for an Enquete Commission. It had about 34 members, half of them members of the parliament, the other half um, external experts, which included people from civil society, from academia, but also from the private sector. Um, also, I mean, some academics like Wolfgang and me, but also other uh, with people with other expertise. And interestingly enough, many of the members knew each other because um, they had been involved, for example, already in WISIS, the World Summit on Information Society. So there is some path dependency and some expertise building over the years uh, brought to fruit in such kind of um, uh, parliamentary um, context. Um, what is specific about an enquete commission and makes it different from other forms of what we would perhaps call participatory democracy is that all members meet on equal footing, meaning we have the same rights as members of the enquete commission, no matter whether we are elected by the people or just nominated by the political factions of the parliamentary system. And that also means that all members take it really seriously. If everybody has the same right and you are not just have the privilege to be heard, then you know why you participate and why you work really hard to make your point and bring the expertise uh, to the table. So how is it organized, such an enquete commission? Um, the, the tasks are uh, defined by the parliament. We had a long laundry list of issues we were supposed to deal with, including security, copyright, privacy, uh, green IT, sort of roughly 10, 13 big uh, thematic issues. And then we formed working groups consisting of all sort of political representatives and the experts working on these specific issues and uh, the end of the working group would be, so the result would be a report. These reports again consisted of two elements. One was sort of an assessment of um, the state of things, what can be known about a given issue. And the second part of the report was specific recommendations building on this first part to the parliament to be taken up if the parliament um, so decides. 
What we can say, and I think Wolfgang and I agree on this, is that writing together the state of the art part on our laundry list was a very good experience. Even though the members of um, the Enquete Commission had often very different ideas about issues such as privacy, we were able to sort of um, depict those controversies by saying in the report, one group thinks this and that, and we would sort of bring evidence from the literature to sort of support this perspective, and another group uh, sees it differently and looks at this issue in the following way, and then we would bring quotes. So the idea was that the people who read this report would get a full uh, sort of comprehensive picture of a controversy surrounding a given issue. So this part of the working groups worked really fine. More difficult it was to agree on recommendations. Of course we couldn't agree on recommendations. And this is where um, a comp or Kent Commission becomes problematic um, because then we had to do majority voting. And the majority voting would um, reflect the majority ratio of the parliament. So that part didn't work nice. Now I come to the point of what can we learn for, from enquete commissions for the area of internet governance. I would say that um, enquete commissions can be a way of bringing new sources of legitimacy to transnational regulation or decision making. What we can see from enquete commissions is that they are really good at bringing all the expertise to the table and also the various options there are for regulation. This is particularly in the area of transnational decision making perhaps a helpful way of compensating for the lack of democratic procedures as we know them from the nation state. Thank you very much. Or do I have Thank more time? No, probably. No, but I have a question um, <laughs> relating to the thing you mentioned, uh, the difference between the voting mode and the other modes. That was really interesting. It's, uh, we had uh, uh, watched, of course, Twitter feeds and other things uh, during these voting sessions, and then there was uh, some uh, notion saying if now dancing dogs would come in, it wouldn't be more absurd. <laughs> and uh, that is definitely right. Um, um, and my question is, um, in your perception, to what extent was the whole work and the whole endeavor coined by the fact that it was all um, structured alongside parliamentary formal rules? Because it is, in fact, it is at the end a special parliamentary committee working uh, on uh, those formal rules. Um, I would uh, answer that question by making the point that the relationship between political decision making and I would say academic expertise is always a very complicated one. On the one hand, we like the idea of evidence-based politics, meaning that political decisions can justify their political preferences with reference to academic expertise, sort of facts, objective studies that show why a certain decision is a good one. But on the other hand, when they get too close, academics and politicians, then there is a chance of sort of um, damaging the reputation of both sides. Academics get accused of sort of uh, manipulating their own expertise or hiding their political preferences um, and politicians get accused of sort of abusing academic expertise by selectively uh, referring to only part of the story. So in our case we had this funny situation that we had sometimes this mode of academic debate by bringing uh, all the facts we had in and trying to really come up with uh, the best and detailed, most detailed picture of an issue, but then we would switch to a more parliamentary way of decision making by doing majority voting on the final report and its recommendations. And that, I think, made people like Wolfgang and me feeling really uneasy about uh, this situation. Also, what we noticed, and that's um, my last point, enquete commissions generally have the idea that we should deal with issues that are not part of day-to-day -day politics in order to avoid to get into the dynamics of 
party A says this and therefore party B must criticize it. So usually issues are chosen for enquete commissions that are more future oriented to avoid that close connection to the dynamics of the parliamentary system. And what happened in Germany is um, that the pirate party uh, suddenly got really popular and therefore all the other parties were forced to deal with internet politics in a much more um, sort of important way than they had so far. So suddenly the parliamentary uh, dynamics moved into uh, mm. our sort of working atmosphere, people from outside would intervene in uh, the, dis uh, the voting behavior of the membership um, and things like that. So we got overwhelmed by the internet mm. pe becoming a more prominent issue in the German uh, press and uh, public sphere. Thanks so much. And I'm looking forward to your input, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Anne. I'm very grateful to be here to share with you some of the insights we got from our M governance study, which we carried out for two years. So I'm going to give you a little bit of the background on the context. So uh, from the iHub, we have a technology community that has over 14,000 members. And this technology community is interested in building applications, whether mobile or web-based, for citizen engagement or for other issues. Um, in Africa, I'm sure as you know, you know that corruption is seen as a development issue that uh, impedes uh, the way a nation can uh, reduce poverty in its states. So the motivation for this was to see how mobile technology could be used as an effective tool to fight corruption. And in this case, uh, the focus was mobile governance, which is uh, looking at applications that will uh, promote public participation, provision of public services, provision of information to citizens, and um, uh, also creating awareness. Um, why did we study the water sector? Well, we looked at all the sectors as a whole, but uh, we realized that in the issue of hierarchy of needs, many citizens, this is information from a previous study, had a high problem with the water sector. So understanding the structure of a sector helps you understand how to build a very effective tool that can be used for citizen engagement. Um, in this case, in, the, in our country, in Kenya, uh, wa the water services are outsourced to a third party. In many nations, the governments directly provide this service to the citizens. But in my country, there is an act that uh, makes the water service provision uh, now delegated to a third party service. One of the biggest issues with this is uh, if I'm dealing with a private vendor, if I have any complaints with regards to water quality or, or water services, uh, my complaints will never ever reach the policy maker who's making decisions that largely affect me. So in looking at how uh, applications can be developed to scale, to enable communication between the government and the citizen on the ground, uh, taking into consideration all these factors in between, uh, these are some of the lessons we learned. Uh, the main challenges people faced was uh, scaling of applications, um, funding to support the applications, government buy-in and partnerships. And I think these are some of the issues that have come, have come out clearly from the previous speakers. Um, how this uh, affects how mobile applications that are built for citizen engagement are used is uh, we found over 20 water applications that had been built but were discarded because they were not able to scale and so citizens were not using them. So if you want to close the loop to show how uh, you can use mobile technology to uh, promote citizen engagement and thus ensure that the feedback loop is closed, uh, you have to tackle all these issues. So I'm going to give an example of one of the applications we found that uh, has managed to uh, kind of create a framework that we can use for reference. It is called Maji Voice. Maji is Swahili for water. So if you go to majivoice.com, you can read more about it. But how this application works is from the iHub, we held a hackathon, which is a programming marathon for 48 hours. And uh, the water stakeholders came together and gave us a bunch of issues to build applications for. 
The second thing that was done was the winners of the hackathon were then uh, given a reward by the World Bank, which is the funding partner, to develop the system. And then there was the water utility, which is the third party vendor that was going to implement the developed solution in their services. And the fourth thing is one of the other partners was government through an organization called WASREP, which is the regulator who uh, regulates the water service providers to make sure that they provide a good service to the citizen. So here you close the feedback loop. You have this application that has been developed by a technology community, and then you have this water vendor who is providing water services to the citizens. And in the application, if a citizen sends a message through uh, the platform, uh, if the vendor does not act with regards to the service uh, level agreement, then the message is escalated to the regulator who follows up. And with regards to funding, we had an external international organization that took care of the development costs of the application. So this is just a, a model of how to use technology, in particular mobile, to close the feedback loop that is faced when you come to issues of uh, promoting uh, digital governance and using technology such as mobile. Maybe just to add why mobile is quite popular. Uh, in Kenya, people, more people have mobiles than have access to resources like internet or electricity. So in this case, uh, looking at how mobile could be used was a better case. Uh, because uh, at the moment, over 75% of our population of 41 million has access to a mobile device, but very few people have access to other resources like internet and electricity. So in this case, leveraging the mobile device uh, was a better choice for it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Indeed, an interesting and fascinating example. Um, you have heard now all the other case studies in this brief description. Is uh, there anything you found interesting or something we, would you like to learn more about uh, to uh, improve your system? Or do you have a question to one of the uh, others to explain more? Yes, uh, the first presentation by Daniel. <coughs> My country just uh, enacted in April a cybersecurity law, and uh, one of the issues that is emerging is uh, all these applications that are being developed uh, to promote communication online. Uh, there is a big loophole with regards to the information that is stored in those applications, and it affects largely cybersecurity as well. So maybe. Uh, would you comment on that and tell us uh, maybe key aspects to consider even as we continue promoting openness of, info of platforms used to encourage dialogue online? Um, I would like to take your question to a more broad, actually the broadest scope of, uh, um, of, uh, of analysis, if I may, and actually make a comment about cybersecurity but also about internet governance given at least three case studies in addition to the one I made by Ryan, Laila, and, uh, and uh, Marile, if I may, and the point, I think, rises from the case of cybersecurity, but then it is also relevant to the other three case studies, at least the three case studies I have heard, is, it's, is that instead of focusing on the two broad models of state control, namely the tight Gulliver model, so to speak, thinking of the net mundial's presumable a developing countries oriented distributive justice related emerging economies approach and on the and, and to some degree also the comcom case and on the other hand if you think about the Aurelia, Aurelia, Aurelian model of course giving the example of Lila in Turkey to some degree but much more Russia and Iran today it seems that from everything we have said something in between is happening that is even more relevant than the two extremes namely the Aurelian model and the tight Gulliver model and it's also true for cybersecurity to a large extent. And that is uh, the rise of uh, kind of a plasmatic type of a nation that is uh, um, obviously an archetypical government that make part of an internet, internet governance apparatus at large that is benevolent. It is social, social, socio-technologically benevolent and goes in between. It shows two, 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 two types of, of patterns. On the one hand, these are governments in many countries, right? Uh, that seem to be uh, much more co in competitively uh, advantageous over the physical and the logical layers. They have better gateways, transit backbone services, ISPs, IP name and address systems, uh, privacy and node systems, and they do that better and better as time goes by. 
And similarly, on the content layer, we see governments uh, competing over content quite effectively. And yet, on the other hand, on what you would call the identity layer, to paraphrase of Slibenkler, what you see is that instead of people, the people, right, rising against governments in this in-between intermediate benevolent social technological model, the people at large are not rising against the, their governments uh, in a kind of in a broad a plasmatic perspective, as I suggested, what you see instead is that the, the ethnocentristic approach by most people in most countries, at least in the uh, liberal democratic countries, uh, people log in, purchase, consume, educate, uh, surf, entertain, ethnocentristically, nationally, and as opposed to internationally, globally, that doesn't really happen as much. And if that is a... Uh, uh, the case comes the question, so what do we do? If indeed it's not an Aurelian set of countries that we need to combat, and on the other hand, it's not a tight Gulliver reality we will really end up getting because net mundial is a vision as opposed to a plan, if I might add my humble opinion here, a, a fine vision by all means, but still a vision as opposed to a real plan, uh, modus operandi of how to get there. Uh, what we need to find is something along the life of an in-between type of it in a governance set of challenges. Instead of focusing, focusing on the old school type of concerns, internet governance was focused, about, uh, uh, focused on gateway scarcity, root splitting, uh, Orwellianism at large, right? We should start thinking of the in-between benevolent type of reality of so many governments uh, worldwide, including mine, in the case that I suggested. The uh, over-regulation of software, of soft law, of course, and standard setting became an issue in a few of the examples you have heard, including my own, uh, we should be more concerned of the way the democratic deficit standard setter organizations are creating in this type of in-between model. Cooperating between industries and governments is all very nice, and yet, is it really cooperation that is taking place or overrunning of the show by SSOs instead uh, with a democratic deficit, of a, with a lack of check and balances, challenge number one, challenge number two, uh, cultural absolutism, you see cultural absolutism and at least cultural relativism in so many examples such as, again, my own, if you make the difference between cyber crime on the one hand and national security motivations on the other in comparison to other countries, and uh, majoritarianism and even syndicalism giving the voluntary stakeholders uh, apparatus, giving that it assumes uh, a group of people in that's type of consensual approach could actually lead to a consensual overtake uh, of the mm. show. Thanks. Thanks very much. I'm afraid that we are already running out of the extra time the uh, organizers kindly offered us for this panel. Uh, it would be fascinating to see more connections, but I think we have uh, seen some already. Um, I do not wrap up the thing here right now, but I will give you with my uh, final words here um, the context and the next steps. Uh, what you have uh, seen here is a presentation and discussion of a set of um, a case studies, the first set of case studies uh, we are um, analyzing as a network of internet research centers. It's part of a bigger endeavor. There will be more case studies. There will be a synthesis based on discussions like the discussion we had here about um, what are the specifics of the case, what are things that uh, are pr uh, problems or issues at least in uh, different uh, case studies like the link to the uh, regulation in place. We talked about that or the rules uh, on which you operate in this kind of enquete commission thing. Um, so it's just a starting point we can see here. It uh, will go on and hopefully with your input and your ideas. Uh, thanks very much. We um, now leave the stage and uh, the next session will, I think, immediately without a break uh, happen here. I thank very much uh, the discussion here. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks to Nexa for inviting us and uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you.
try not to be directly in the light of the Well, how many are we? Four. Four? Spread out. No, actually, we should stop that before. <laughs> there, there used to be a feature all the time huh? in the New Yorker magazine for bad metaphors called Block That Metaphor. Oh. Okay, just testing whether this microphone is working, and I guess it is. Uh, welcome to the session. Um, I'm very happy to have with me here all four panelists that will be speaking. Um, this session is around building blocks and toolkits for distributed internet governance models. And here we will take a more practical uh, look at some tools, best practices, and platforms that are aimed at supporting the formation, performance, and uh, of distributed col and collaborative internet governance models, groups, and mechanisms. Um, with me, I'm Maite Schomburg. I am based with the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society in Berlin and have been the coordinator of the network of centers for the past two years. And I'm very grateful to our hosts here at the Nexa Center for organizing, hosting this event. Um, with me, at the far end, I have Bill Drake, who is International Fellow and Lecturer in the Media Change and Innovation Division at the Institute of Mass Communication and Media Research at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. He's also the Chair um, of the Non-Commercial Users Constituency in ICANN and uh, a member of the Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group of the UN's Internet Governance Forum. Lastly, he's a member of the multi-stakeholder OneNet Coalition's Coordinating Committee and probably uh, is active in many other formats as well, which uh, I cannot all mention here for the lack of time. He will be talking about IGF best practice models. Next to my right, I have Jovan Kub Kubalia. How do you? Oh, perfect, thank you. Um, who is the founding director of the Diplo Foundation based in Geneva, also in Switzerland. He's a former diplomat with a professional and academic background in international law, diplomacy, and information diplomacy. He will be talking about the Geneva Internet Platform. Here I have Stefan Verholst, who is the co-founder and chief research development officer of the Governance Lab at the New York University, where he's also responsible for building a research foundation on how to transform governance using advances in science and technology. He's also an adjunct professor in the Department of Culture and Communications at New York University. Um, and finally, I have Constance uh, Baumelaire, who is a remote participant. You can see her here. Um, thank you very much for going through the trouble of setting uh, this, participation, uh, this uh, remote participation tool up. I know it wasn't very easy. Um, she's the Senior Director of Global Policy Partnerships at the Internet Society, um, also called ISOC and helps developing partnerships with international organizations, as well as strategic positions on key internet issues. She founded and now coordinates the Internet Technical Advisory Committee at the OECD, and also leads ISOC's engagement with UNESCO, WIPO, the G8, the G20, and the IGF. Now, um, I'm very determined. <laughs> I may be German, but I was uh, uh, educated in Switzerland, uh, so we're um, big on timing. Very determined to leave some uh, space for a discussion with you, the audience. So please do ignore the distance between this podium and yourselves, and just pretend you're sitting here with us, and really do take the opportunity to, after these presentations, join in, in the discussion. And now, without further ado, I uh, pass on to Bill Drake. Thank you, Maita, and hello again. Um, so the last panel established the precedent that we could sit with the laptops that are in our laps, so that's good, so this time I can follow along what I, I've been thinking of saying. Um, I was asked to talk about uh, an argument that I've advanced with a, a colleague uh, in a recent uh, book that was prepared before the IGF about institutionalizing uh, the clearinghouse function um, in internet governance 
and I will uh, say a bit about what that, what I mean by that. And so I'm going to basically uh, talk off of that, and it links very closely with what Stefan will be talking about later, and, uh, and he's going to give a, a specific example of an uh, um, initiative that he's doing now that sort of uh, is along the same lines. Um, if you start from the basic premise of looking at the ecosystem as an ecosystem and asking uh, how well is not, does knowledge uh, and information relevant to internet governance get aggregated, uh, compiled, circulated, made available, digested, etc., cetera, um, for stakeholders, governments, etc. cetera, uh, I think one could argue that um, we, we face a, a, an unusual problem. There's both information overload and at the same time an undersupply of usable information. Uh, we find all the time that there's massive amounts of knowledge and information being generated about internet governance, but yet we find very often that people find it difficult to process all of that, to find their way through the thicket of what's available in order to formulate um, solutions. And this is a challenge, I think, particularly for newcomers and for developing country governments uh, uh, who often express the concern that um, in trying to figure out how to tackle uh, certain kinds of problems, whether it's spam or network security or so on, um, where there is not some established global mechanism to serve as a, a, a guidance or a negotiation framework, um, it's difficult for them to sort of sort through all the, the information and get effective access to it in a way that they can use. And this has, I think, helped to, to um, stimulate the demand on the part of some developing country governments uh, over the past decade for a greater intergovernmental role in internet governance. The idea that we needed some sort of a new centralized one-stop uh, shop that could provide access to information and be the place where you could tackle all the different problems that come up uh, is, uh, has been very much a live concern for many uh, governments. And you, know, you can understand their perspective in some ways because it is uh, very, very difficult. We've talked in the first panel about the distributed nature of the institutional environment and how there's so many different uh, diff forums and processes and so on, it's hard for anybody to really track all of that, make sense of it, and particularly to respond effectively to some of the challenges that where there isn't a well-structured mechanism in place uh, is an issue. And so this has been discussed a lot uh, in various contexts through the from the World Summit on the Information Society process in 2002 to 2005, through the Internet Governance Forums development and so on. Uh, and the whole debate that we've had uh, at the global level about enhanced cooperation. And they still, there was a working group on enhanced cooperation that tried to map so, some of these issues and, and say, uh, how can we address the so-called orphaned issues, the issues that don't fall clearly within the jurisdiction of one international organization, but yet which are pressing and with, to which governments want to respond. And that effort ultimately did not um, yield the best fruit, but it's, there's still some ongoing work related to that. So th this has been a point that some of us in civil society have been pressing for quite some time. If you go back a decade to some of the early thinking around the, the Internet Governance Forum, there were proposals from many of us in civil society that the IGF could play this kind of uh, clear knowledge and information clearinghouse function, that it would uh, be a place where you could do ongoing uh, monitoring of developments, gathering of information, aggregation of information into usable formats, and then uh, provisioning uh, uh, dissemination to developing country governments and other actors. Um, and one could additionally uh, do other things like, on top of simply making information available, providing analysis or providing fac facilitation in the development of what we've called distributed governance groups, that's to say, forming policy networks that can help you solve a problem. Um, and that idea has come up again in recent years. It's been endorsed in the Net Mondial uh, statement, and it was in the, the Ilvis report, which we referred to earlier. Um, so the question then becomes, is there something here that we could do that would be really useful to help reduce the friction and the transaction costs and the information costs of trying to access and make usable information so that actors are more effectively able to participate in global governance decision making. I can imagine three possible uh, ways in which this could be especially useful. 
Uh, one is, as I said, uh, this notion of orphaned issues, which has been much debated. Uh, the, you know, many times the governments say, well, for example, security is an orphan issue because there's no UN agency that has comprehensive responsibility for network security issues. So where do we go when we have a problem with security issues, et cetera? The reality is that there's a vast amount of work being done on security, but it's all dis distributed across a variety of different institutional environments. And it's hard for actors to grab all that, pull all that together and figure out, okay, Based on what's out there, here's how I could forge a, a new approach at the national level, et cetera. So dealing with orphaned issues or perceived orphaned issues would be one thing that such an information supply mechanism could do. Another thing would be to provide broad and balanced access to information because sometimes governments and other actors get access to information about some governance challenge that reflects one view and not the range of views that are out there. I think in particular of the World Conference on International Telecommunications that went on in 2012. We had this huge global debate. You'll recall that the, the effort to revise the international telecommunications regulations ended up with a very divisive uh, process where 55 governments refused to sign the treaty and 89 did. Um, and part of what was going on there was that the different sides were hearing one kind of take, one kind of view about what the issues were, what the challenges were. So making sure that people have access to balanced information about all issues from multiple perspectives, I think, could be useful. And thirdly, creating a mechanism to help provide um, a, a broad cross-cutting kind of assessment of how internet governance is being done in different environments and assessing the extent to which those different environments meet standards of good practice, that's to say, how transparent are they, how accountable are they, how inclusive are they in their decision making, et cetera, in order to encourage uh, institutional environments to move up their game in terms of meeting those standards by sharing information in an organized way. These are things I think that one could possibly imagine doing. And the question then becomes, how could you do it? Well, these are all uh, issues, these are complex issues, obviously, and the kinds of functions that we're talking about, organizing information, aggregating it, putting it together into formats that can be used, uh, providing analysis, uh, providing relationship management, these are things that could be viewed in a modular way and could be handled in a number of different bodies, but then you have sometimes inadequate co coordination um, and you don't kind of get as much out of it as you might be able to or they can be done in a sort of more integrated way, in a single kind of uh, mechanism focused on a particular issue set or geographical region, et cetera. And so what we've advanced is an argument about how one might start to think about formulating such a thing, what the elements of it would be in terms of um, the, the, you know, how you design it, uh, what would be the different aspects that have to be built into it, most particularly making sure that there's a real user engagement in the design of, of such things, because there's not much point in the global community coming and saying, you know, hello, we're, we're here from Geneva and we're ready to help, you know, and you know, formulating some big complex new mechanism that the actors don't want to use. You have to make sure that this is effectively co-designed with the, par the, the potential users. But there's a number of different elements that could be taken on board in thinking about how to do this. And then the second set of questions, and then I'll conclude, is uh, where or how would you institutionalize this function of providing more effective information access and so on. And there's a lot of different possibilities here, ranging from simply strengthening the status quo and helping those organizations that are already involved in the knowledge provisioning business to do so in a more effective and coordinated way, to creating some new kind of mechanism, whether within an existing intergovernmental organization, although I think that would be problematic, or a new multi-stakeholder body or something. Uh, there are a lot of different ways that one can tackle these problems. So the, to conclude, the challenge then is to say, is there a need to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of information and knowledge uh, provisioning and management at the global level? And if so, how can we effectively intervene and try to make a difference uh, in that problem. And Stefan has uh, been working on one possible element of that solution. So I, I turn to him and others uh, on the panel. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. It was nine minutes and 59 seconds, which is pretty impressive. Um, Constance, I would now turn to you. Um, you have been uh, heavily involved with um, coordinating um, the best practice sessions that uh, were first tried within the Internet Governance Forum this year. So perhaps you can share with us some of your experiences and takeaways from that. Absolutely. C can you hear me well? Can everyone hear her well? Yes, the audience is nodding. Okay, Th thank you very much and thank you for accommodating um, remote participation to, to your discussions today. Um, I was listening with great attention to what uh, Bill uh, Drake uh, w was saying and, and I, I think I agree with his assessment. Uh, there really is a need to uh, strengthen uh, existing bodies, existing fora who have this capacity of uh, coordinating information, coordinating efforts, uh, and making sure that uh, the quality and availability of information is possible for all uh, interested stakeholders. Um, I realize that you may have difficulties to see my face. Maybe we have a light problem here. I'm, I'm sorry about that, but I, I, hope the, I hope the sound is good at least. Um, so, building on this um, acknowledgement that uh, the community is in search of a forum, of a place where literally it can take its burning, emerging internet-related issues, work together uh, on shared outcomes, and um, especially share the expertise from the different stakeholder groups. I mean, you need to have at the table technical experts, but you also obviously need to bring in uh, policymakers and the voice of civil society and, and business as well. Um, we envisioned uh, that the IGF could literally step up um, with